All right, our text this morning is relatively brief. Um, Paul and Barnabas again coming to the synagogue of the Jews to proclaim the gospel. And then the next time we're going to see them uh, as they go to these other towns after being driven out, as it were, from um, uh, Iconium, uh, we're going to see them encounter the Gentiles, and we're going to get a good example of, of how they approach the Gentiles, which I think will be good for our apologetic uh, studies. But we're going to look just at verses 1 through 7 of Acts 14 this morning. So may the Lord give us grace to listen carefully to this passage. This is God's Word. Luke writes, by the inspiration of the Spirit, in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So again, there, there are several different things we see in this passage, and I hope by God's grace that he'll, uh, well, really drive these things home into our minds and hearts. Well, um, again, you can study, or we can study the book of Acts from a variety of perspectives. We can take it apart piece by piece and look at every little bit of data and perhaps draw out all the doctrines from that, uh, you know, from this, uh, this book. And if we did that... We might very well end up with something like Joseph Carroll, who spent, I forget, something like 30, or 30 years preaching on the book of Job. And it's, it's a wonderful study. I think it encompasses either 10 to 14 volumes. Um, he preached the whole Bible through the book of Job, and that's one way to approach it. Or you can kind of take more of a, um, like a jet tour, you know, and just kind of get, see the landscape instead of descending into all the different uh, details and trees. But you could also look at it from differing perspectives, and I think this is certainly a perspective that our Lord would have us to have, and that is how did the disciples actually approach people and minister the gospel to them. And so that's kind of how we're approaching this, and we're, we're looking at little bits and details. And one of the things we've seen uh, so far is how Paul accommodated his message to his audience, simply practicing what he tells us elsewhere to the Jew, he became as a Jew, and of course, to the Greek, as a Greek. Now, as he relates to Jews, being Jewish made that relatively easy, and we saw apologetically or evangelistically how he, certain things he could expect from the Jews that he couldn't expect from the Gentiles, and one thing is that they would respect the Scriptures. And so he could begin his argument there, and that's how he would approach them. But at the same time, Paul also understood, as he details for us in the book of Romans and in the book of Ephesians and also in other of his letters, that they would never accept his interpretation, his understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures unless the Lord granted the grace of the new birth. So he had to share the gospel with them from the Old Testament Scriptures, but at the same time, he knew that he had to rely upon the Lord to give the grace of the new birth. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't understand what he was saying. They could compare what he was saying with the Old Testament Scriptures, and they could know that what he was saying was true. But what this means is they would never receive it. They would never embrace Jesus. They would never even admit that he is the Messiah apart from the Lord's work. So we need the Word. We need the Spirit's work. We also need to understand that the problem with the people that we seek to bring the gospel to is not a matter of understanding. I mean, they need to hear the truth, but they have the ability to understand that truth. The problem is in their hearts. They do not want to believe that these things are true so that they can live the kind of life they would prefer to live, which is not a life of righteousness, but rather a life of sin. 
Now, RC is going to deal with this difference between giving evidence and trying to persuade somebody in his apologetics series. He tells, I think he's told us already, that we need to offer proof. And we can offer proof, absolute, irrefutable proof, truth that they can see, that they can know and understand and know is right. But they will never be persuaded to embrace that truth. We can't change their hearts. Only the Spirit can change their hearts, which is why we need to rely upon His work because the Lord says the Spirit of God will work when we are proclaiming the gospel. He will call Christ's sheep to Himself. They will hear His voice. They will follow Him. Now, Luke also tells us that Paul and Barnabas have been ministering to the Gentiles, but he hasn't actually shown us yet how they approach them. But as I've said next week, he will give us an, ex an example. And let me just give you a little bit of a preview. And the reason why I'm doing this is just so we can combine what we're doing in the evenings and the mornings. And if we keep these things perhaps in our minds long enough, we'll remember them. Hearing them just once isn't enough. We have to hear them again and again and again. But they will start with natural revelation. The revelation God gives in nature uh, of His divine attributes, His invisible attributes, that revelation which actually gets through to all people so that they already know that God exists. And we'll, we'll see how effective that is. And again, remember, ultimately it depends on the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the gospel, as we know, is the fulfillment of all the covenants that God made with the Jews. And this is what Paul was seeking to bring out to the Jewish people as he opens up uh, the Old Testament scriptures. He begins with what they know. Jesus is the seed, the child that is promised to Abraham, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He is the fulfillment of the Mosaic sacrifices that alone can reconcile us to God. He alone has obeyed the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, and that enables Him to give His Holy Spirit, as we've already seen this morning, to take His law and to write it on the tablets of our hearts, which means to give us the power to obey. He is the Son of David, who now sits on the throne in heaven, exercising absolute sovereignty over everything, so that his kingdom will advance and fill the earth. He is the one who has given us the blessings of the new covenant so that we will receive his kingdom, the internal inheritance, if we are trusting in him. Now, it's because the Jews rejected these blessings, the ones that Paul enumerated to them in our text last time, that he has turned to the Gentiles, that he has turned to the world, that He has turned to us and given to us the blessings that were actually meant for them. We'll notice that there's a pattern that's going on here in the Scriptures, and that is that Paul goes to the Jew first because all this was promised to them. But because they reject it, then he turns to the Gentiles. That's the reason why the blessing has come to us. That is the reason why we have justification. Our sins are forgiven. We have His perfect righteousness. That's why we're free from hell. That's why we have a new relationship with God. That's why we have something better than reconciliation. We have adoption as the Lord's sons and daughters and an inheritance in the new creation, which the Lord will bring when Jesus returns. It's because the Jews rejected the Messiah that the Lord has turned to us in order to make them jealous. So it is tragic, it is sad the Jews rejected him, but in God's plan, he has used that for something good. He has used that to bring us to him. So again, we're going to see this going back and forth to the Jew first because the promises were made to them, and then when they reject, to the Gentiles. This morning, we see Paul and Barnabas in Iconium, again persevering in the ministry of the gospel, going to the Jew first. Now, we see something different in just about each of these verses, so I'm just going to go through them verse by verse, and hopefully each one will have its, its message of encouragement. So first of all, we see in verse 1, the gospel is preached with, with power. Luke writes, in Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner 
that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. Now, Iconium is, is really, if, if you remember, they started in Cyprus, and then they, they went uh, to the mainland, as it were, went north, and they went up into the mountains to uh, Antioch, Pisidian Antioch, which is, I think there were something like 16 cities that were named Antioch. Uh, because the person who established them was honoring his father, whose name was Antiochus, not Antiochus Epiphanes, but there were other Antiochuses. Uh, and so we have several of these. This one happened to be Antioch in the region of Pisidian. Now, from there, they essentially went east after they had been driven out. And that's where Iconium was, and that's where these other cities are we're going to read about next time. Now, when they arrived, they weren't idle, but they went right to work. On the first Sabbath, they entered into the synagogue. Now, remember the synagogues? Synagogues are everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. Wherever the Jews were dispersed, they established, the first thing they did as a community was to establish a synagogue if they had enough people in that community. A synagogue simply means a, a meeting place, a place where they could gather, a place where they could fulfill their duty to the Lord every Sabbath, keeping His Sabbaths holy, meeting together for worship. Now, as was the custom, the synagogue rulers would ask traveling rabbis, and that's how they perceived Paul and Barnabas to be, to give the exhortation after the reading of the Scripture. And on this particular occasion, Luke tells us that they spoke in such a way, with, with such power, with such demonstration of the Spirit, that many people believed. Now, what I want us to see from, from this particular example is, is this. You know, we understand from Romans chapter 1 that Paul tells us that it's the gospel that God uses to save. Okay? It, that's why we need to communicate it. Uh, it. The Spirit makes that message powerful. We know that's true. Verse 16, Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, what makes the gospel powerful, of course, is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that enables a person actually to see its, their need for it, to see its glory, its beauty, and to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the Spirit, there's really no power in the gospel, okay? But it's the gospel the Spirit uses. Now, um, but that's not all He uses, okay? Okay. Now, I thought as an example of this, I could use Spurgeon's, you know, the, uh, the testimony that Spurgeon gives of his own conversion. How on one particular Lord's Day as he was on his way to church, the, the, you know, the church he was accustomed to going to, uh, there was a, a powerful snowstorm that diverted him to another congregation. It was a primitive Methodist chapel. And on that particular morning, there was a lay preacher who was uh, ministering, lay minister, and his text, as I've already told you, was Isaiah 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Now, Spurgeon writes in his autobiography this. He, referring to this lay minister, had not much to say. Thank God. <laughs> for that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. And there was nothing needed by me at any rate except his text. Okay, so Spurgeon is telling us it's, it's a good thing this guy couldn't think of anything else to say because what he needed to hear was the Word of God, okay? And so he heard it over and over again. The Word, uh, the Spirit uses the Word to convert. But we would be wrong to think that it doesn't matter how that Word is communicated. I mean, for instance, Luke here ties the result that Paul and Barnabas saw to the way that they preached. They spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed. In other words, you know, the way they spoke had something to do with their conversion. And you know what? Spurgeon actually may have needed something more, and he may actually express that as he continues his testimony. So then he says next, Then, stopping... He pointed to where I was sitting under the gallery and he said, that young man there looks very miserable. And he shouted, as I think only a primitive Methodist can. <laughs> Not sure what, that, what that's like. Look, look, young man, look now. Then I had this vision. Not a vision to my eyes, but to my heart. 
I saw what a Savior Christ was. Now, I can never tell you how it was, but I no sooner saw whom I was to believe than I also understood what it was to believe, and I did believe in one moment. Now, what he's expressing here is essentially that what the new birth gives, a new sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see him through the eyes of faith, you understand that you need to trust him. It's not just believing the facts that he exists, what the Bible says is true and all these abstract truths, as it were, are real, but actually seeing Jesus, seeing him is beautiful, embracing him with your heart, loving him because of this new birth of the Holy Spirit. But my point is this, I mean, the Spirit uses the gospel. He uses the word to convert, no question about that. But he also makes the messenger powerful to arrest the attention of the hearer so that they, the hearers, will listen and by the gospel be saved. So, in other words, just as the gospel itself is a means of salvation, and just as the Lord tells us that our lives are to be epistles read by everyone, we are to be living examples of the reality, the truth of what the gospel can do in the life as a means. And, you know, again, our example either drawing them near or else pushing them away, we need to have a good example. The way that we communicate the gospel is also another means that the Spirit uses. Now, if we don't appear to believe what we're saying then I don't think we're going to have much of an impact on our hearers. If we don't appear to take it seriously or think it's important, I don't think they're going to take it seriously either. You know, there is something which the Bible calls the demonstration, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes across in our delivery. Now, I think an important question we, we should ask is this, how can we have this kind of power, this kind of urgency, this kind of zeal? Well, we can only have it through the Spirit's work. In order to have that, we do have to seek Him. We do have to spend time in His Word. We do need to listen to Him. We do need to walk with Him. We do need to pray. We do need to worship. That's what the means of grace are all about. You know, we talk about means of grace. It sounds kind of abstract. But what we mean is reading the Bible with faith, responding to what we read in the Bible, believing, obeying, repenting, uh, that's what it means. It means praying and asking for help. It means that when we're faced with situations, we make choices we know that will be pleasing to the Lord. That strengthens His grace within us. And if we make choices contrary to His will, if we do what's displeasing to Him, it grieves the Spirit and quenches His work. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we share the gospel with somebody, there's something that kind of comes out. It's almost like Spurgeon talking about letting the lion out of the cage. There's this kind of zeal and power that you have, this enthusiasm, this, this affection for the Lord, and it arrests attention. But that's what we need to do if we are to have that kind of power, even the power to overcome our fears, to be able to share the gospel in the first place. We need to put the kingdom of heaven first. We need to yield ourselves to the Lord, give ourselves to Him at all times. We need to seek by His grace to fulfill the great commandment and the second greatest commandment, love the Lord with all that we have, love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And as we do these things, then we will see this kind of power in our lives. You know, we, we seem to think that Paul had this power and so he, he went out and did these things, but I, I think we see almost a snowballing effect in the life of the Apostle Paul. The more that he gives himself to evangelism, the more he suffers for it, the more he has to argue for it, I think the more, you know, he, he gets strengthened in the Lord and becomes much more powerful in, in the Lord. You see, it's only on that path that we can find this kind of strength. You know, there's also those unusual circumstances that uh, we call revival that can bring this kind of power, but I don't know that we should count on it. We should pray for it, but I don't know that we should count on it when I came here years ago, how long has it been? Almost 30 years now. And at the very beginning was just in our prayer meetings, praying for these things, praying for these things, asking for revival. And we've been doing it for 30 years. But Jonathan Edwards and his correspondence in Scotland essentially did the same thing. And they even set aside prayer meetings specifically for the purpose of 
revival, asking God for revival, but they didn't see any more revivals after what's called the Great Awakening because they come sovereignly in God's will. But when they do come, they do bring power. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, Preaching and Preachers, speaks of how the Spirit came on a particular minister during a time of revival and how his preaching, which had little effect on his hearers, suddenly uh, had a very strong effect because he went from something like a lamb to a lion in his preaching. People began to flood into the church. People were, were saved. I mean, that, that's how uh, the Lord worked in those days during a revival. Okay, these are revival times. And that's not how it works normally. But when the revival was gone, his preaching went from that of a lion to a lamb almost overnight, and that's how he continued through the rest of his ministry. So those are unusual times, and we should pray for those because those are great and those are powerful. But other than that, we need to pray that God would give to us grace and strength so that the way that we speak, you know, would, would really undergird the message that we're bringing. It may not be as important as the message itself, but it's still a very powerful means to get people to listen. Now, that's the first point. I have a few others that are much shorter. Secondly, okay, they preach with great power, and people are being changed. They're being converted. Many turn to the Lord. But then we see the enemy push back in verse 2. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. There were those who were persuaded. There were those who were unpersuaded, uh, those who were unaffected by the gospel and the powerful delivery of Paul and Barnabas. Now, we understand that with the gospel, there's always going to be two responses, right? Because the Lord uses the gospel for two purposes, to soften and, and to harden. Now, we know that the Lord, when he, when he softens, He simply gives His Holy Spirit to change hearts. When He hardens, it's not the Lord Himself necessarily that is directly hardening the heart, but rather that is the response of those who are basically dead in sin. They harden their hearts against the gospel. So the Lord sends, him, sends them His gospel, which is a very gracious and good thing on His part. But they react by hardening themselves against it. By the way, this is how we are to understand the case of Pharaoh, remember? When Paul's talking about Pharaoh, he says God raised him up in order to destroy him. God hardened his heart so that he wouldn't repent and let the Israelites go. And then we're left with this question, does that mean that, that God is zapping people with evil and, and strengthening them in their sins so that they carry out their wickedness and so he can bring about his judgments? Well, no, that's not what it means at all. But what it means is this, that he sent Moses to confront Pharaoh, to tell him to do the right thing, let my people go. That was the right thing to do, wasn't it? But Pharaoh responded in a sinful way. He let his pride harden his heart so that he wouldn't obey. As a matter of fact, I mean, some people today might say, you know, Moses, you really shouldn't go to Pharaoh because if you tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he's just going to respond in this way and you're going to push him away. You're going to push him away from the gospel. Why do you keep going to him, Moses, after every one of these plagues and tell him the same thing? You're just pushing him away. Well, no, he's, he's not pushing Pharaoh away. He's telling Pharaoh to do the right thing, right? But Pharaoh is rejecting God and hardening his heart. So what God is doing is basically exposing Pharaoh to what is good, and he knows at the same time, because he's withholding his grace from Pharaoh, that Pharaoh's sin in his heart is simply going to make him get harder against the Lord. So this wasn't God's fault. This was Pharaoh's fault, and the fault is on the part of these who would not believe. Now, the word disbelieved in our passage is more accurately translated disobeyed, and that's what it literally means. And that helps us to understand that this gospel that they're preaching is not merely an offer. Okay, that's the way we present the gospel today. Come to the Lord, and He will give you forgiveness and eternal life. And, you know, and it is an offer because He does offer something. But we need to understand it's also a command. The gospel is a command. Repent is a command. Believe is a command, isn't it? Uh, they heard the command, but they would not obey, which means they would not believe. That's why it says they disbelieved. 
and they would not follow Jesus. And on top of that, they also did everything they could to turn the Gentiles against them as well. You know, people who hate the Lord, it's not enough for them to hate the Lord personally. They're going to do everything they can to turn as many people as they can against Him as well. And the reason why they do that is because it brings them a kind of comfort, doesn't it? Uh, their strength in numbers. They, they feel like the more people who, who side with them, the more right they are and the more wrong the other side is. But truth is not determined by how many people believe one thing or the other. Truth is determined by what the Word of God actually says. So it may bring them some comfort, but sadly, uh, it's only going to make matters worse for them on the Day of Judgment. Now, so we see again the, the, the powerful preaching, we see the pushback, but thirdly, we see that in spite of the pushback, Paul and Barnabas persist. We read in verse 3, Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. You know, this almost sounds like the opposite of what you would expect, doesn't it? Uh, they were embittered. They turned the, um, the Gentiles against them. Therefore, they spent a long time there. Uh, it almost doesn't seem to make sense because of that strife, because of that struggle against them. But the reason they stayed there was because they knew God was in it. They knew God was calling them to stay there. He was still bearing fruit through their ministry. He was giving them boldness. He was giving them power in their preaching. People were being converted. And perhaps most importantly, God was providing irrefutable evidence that the message they were bringing was in fact from above as He testified through signs and wonders. Now remember, R.C. is going to tell us in our apologetic series that this is the key, still the key, to proving that the Bible is the Word of God. If we're going to offer you know, uh, arguments, rational proof, this is the proof because this is the way that God always proved His Word. Okay, once we establish that God exists, that there is a God who can do miracles, we then need to prove that the Bible is His Word, and the way we prove it is the way God proved it, which is by doing something only He can do. We prove it through miracle. Now, today we don't have the ability to do miracles because God is no longer giving that ability to do miracles, though we would say that there's nothing to prevent God from doing miracles. He doesn't do it through any particular individual. And the reason is because He's already authenticated His Word once and for all by doing the miracle in the first place. And again, those miracles are recorded for us in Scripture. So what we need to do is point to the eyewitness accounts, the many eyewitness accounts that we have in the Bible. We would argue that the Bible, I mean, we argue the Bible is the Word of God. We know the Bible is the Word of God because the Lord has testified to us through His Holy Spirit, He has shown us that it is the Word of God. Although we have, you know, He, he does bear witness to the many evidences that it is the Word of God, but we have an infallible assurance that comes through the Holy Spirit. That's a part of illumination. But we can't share that with somebody else, as Spurgeon was basically saying. I knew in a moment what it meant to trust in Jesus, but I can't tell you what it's like. It's something you have to see for yourself. That's something only the Spirit of God can give. But there is something we can give by way of argument other than our subjective experience, and it's this, that the Bible is the Word of God because the one that the Lord has testified to in His Word, both by allowing Him to do many miracles and by raising Him from the dead, that is Jesus, tells us that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, so basically the testimony of, of the miracles that were done, the miracles prove the messenger, the messenger says the Bible is the Word of God. And so that is basically our argument. It's not our only argument. There's fulfilled prophecy. There's, again, all the different ways that um, uh, the Bible shows itself to, to in its, basically in its perfections to show us that it is His Word. These are the things the Spirit of God testifies to. But if we're sharing to an unbeliever who has no background in this, we can simply, I think, use this argument. And you know what? The Lord's going to hold him accountable 
for that particular argument. The reason why he allowed every, you know, so many people to see Jesus alive from the dead was that he might have witnesses. And this is the witness we have in the Bible. It's the only witness we have. And this is what we're telling them. They need to trust. Okay, so essentially um, we see in this passage they persisted in spite of the pushback. Fourth, we see their preaching inevitably resulted in a partitioning. Okay, I'm using peace, so that's the reason why I use this word, but a division, okay? Between those in the world and those who are in the kingdom of God. We read in verse 4, but the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Now, we need to understand, of course, why this is taking place, and the reason is because there is a division that exists in the world. There's two kingdoms. Everyone is in one or the other. Now, it's interesting. The gospel is actually what creates this division uh, in a good way, okay? Because everyone, as they come into the world, and it doesn't matter whether you're born into a non-Christian household or in a Christian household, everyone born into the world is born into the kingdom of the devil, okay? We were born into that kingdom, <clears throat> the Jews, who were opposing. They were born into that kingdom. We think that's, that sounds strange, don't, because uh, who was it that Jesus said, or to whom did he say, you are of your father the devil? He said it to the Jews, and he said it to the Jewish leaders. They were a part of God's church, and yet he says, you're in the kingdom of the evil one, which means that's where they were born and that's where they have continued to this day. So we were born into that kingdom. The Jews that opposed were born into that kingdom. Those who were siding with them were born into that kingdom. Everybody in the world is born into that kingdom. And it's only when we embrace Jesus by His grace that we are brought into God's kingdom. And that's when the division begins. That's the reason why it exists, because there are these two kingdoms. And that is why those in the devil's kingdom, will begin to fight against us when we come into the kingdom of light. And so that's what we see now, fifthly, the division brought persecution, verses 5 and 6. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of, of Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. So the unbelieving Gentiles, Jews, their rulers, they wanted to stone them, so they, they left, <laughs> okay? They moved somewhere else. And there's certainly nothing wrong with withdrawing when those we want to minister to become hostile and unrighteously want to take our lives. But we see this persecution. We see this, you know, persecution brought about by hatred because of this division. As Christians, we understand that we cannot behave in that way. Our Lord tells us we are to love our enemies, that our retaliation is tell them the truth and pray for them and, and do good to them, right? Return good for their evil. But we need to understand the enemy's camp has no such ethic, and they will do everything they can to stop us, including abusing us, of course, deriding us, uh, perhaps injuring us, and at certain times in history, even murdering us. If you consider the history of the church, the Roman church, you know, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, imprisoned and tried and tortured and burned Protestants at the stake. They instituted the Inquisition by which they tried to torture people out of their profession of faith. They tried to snuff out what we would consider to be the truth. There was a man by the name of Fox who wrote a book called Fox's Acts and Monuments, you know, there's what's called Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is like this slim little volume. And most of us haven't read that, but there's this seven-volume work, I think, a, a chronicle that this man uh, produced that, that basically gives us accounts, just filled with accounts of the torture and the murder of Bible-believing Christians because he did not want what the Roman church did to Protestants to be forgotten. The, the kingdom of the evil one, Okay, has no limits to what they will do. Now, people argue the Roman Catholic Church was sincere. They were trying to actually save them, save them by torture, save them by burning them at the stake, you know. 
I don't, I don't think you'd be hard-pressed to find any justification for that in the Bible, okay? Love your enemies, that's what the Bible says. But they did, but because they're in the kingdom of the evil one apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And consider the world today. Consider how unbelievers respond to Christians. Consider the persecutions that the church are going through in other countries. Consider what it's getting like here. Paul reminds us that if we live godly, if we shine as lights in the world, we are going to be persecuted. And by the way, Jesus told us that persecution would extend even into our own households. People of our own household will hate us because we love the Lord, because we're telling them the truth. But again, our responsibility is love them even though they might persecute us. But finally, and most importantly, we see perseverance. Perseverance in the midst of all these difficulties. We read in verse 6 that after they fled to these other cities, they continued to preach the gospel. Even though Paul and Barnabas were hated by their own people, they continued to do what the Lord sent them to do, which was to bear witness to the resurrection, to preach the gospel. They didn't let this persecution of some turn them away from being faithful to God. They didn't let the rejection of some lead them to believe that everyone was going to reject their message. They knew that there were those who belonged to Jesus, and so they kept looking for these lost sheep, and they did it by preaching the gospel. That's how you find them. You know, you, we, could, we could, you know, spend all day walking through crowds looking for Jesus' lost sheep, but if we never say anything, we're never going to find any, right, because they all look the same. You have to speak the gospel. How they respond to it tells you whether they are one of his sheep or not. Those who are his sheep will hear his voice, and they will follow him. Those who aren't, well, you may not get such a warm response from them, okay? That's the reason why there's persecution. But in spite of the persecution, we need to persevere. We need to be persistent in our evangelism. We need to be persistent in our service to God. We know there's going to be pushback. We know there's going to be persecution, even by those who are closest to us. But we also know that there's going to be success, that there are going to be those who come to Him because Christ has sheep who belong to Him, and they will hear. We just need to be faithful to share, to speak, to give the gospel. So may the Lord help us. Uh, Help us to do that. Help us to persevere, even though there, there are um, difficulties along the way. Oh, those old cell phones, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, let's, uh, let's take just a moment, shall we? And let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us apply what it is we've just, um, we've just heard.